And I'm happy to do that. And I also believe that we don't get way beyond um, yeah. what I've already been presenting. But you know, just since not most of you are not thinking about these issues all the time, let me just recap instead of giving a longer introduction as I would normally do. Uh, um, but I have been uh, presenting in the, in the basis of this talk um, for most of the time. So the, the idea really of, of the, the very first ideas of classical smoothing is before you use computer that I was uh, trying to argue one way or the other to prepare the initial conditions of the hot Big Bang expression as, at least with respect to the background geometry, which we know is um, flat Friedman Roberts and Walker on large scales and then um, as in measuring the microwave background uh, with nearly scale invariant temperature or density fluctuations. Um, and so far, no detectable tensor modes. It, the core idea has been, and you know, in the meantime, of course, we have been behind it. But really, let me just for the for the first slide, uh, um, and we get almost immediately beyond that. Remain with the core idea that the idea has been. Let's assume that whether you come from and that was that and that will remain the main main uh, focus of the talk uh, from a slowly contracting phase. Uh, yeah. The, the Issue with the zoom figure. Okay, I can stay there. That's if it's easier. Change is better, yeah. I can also stay closer to the mics. That's fine. Um, okay, so uh, to to start what big before what big bang expansion, the idea was let's start with some small Hubble size horizon and whether Hubble size volume and that is the middle volume. Um, and by one way or the other, extend the features of, 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 of a Hubble uh, uh, patch that has almost the right geometry. This was just a Friedman equation that I have been, or the first uh, Friedman equation, Friedman constraint. We will get back to this. So let me just, uh, for those who remember, it is there. And for those who don't remember, we will get back to this equation. So the importance is that uh, if one considers just zero mode curvature term and some sort of, and we got definitely, I remember when is asked where it comes from. And if I do a good job in 40 minutes, we will actually derive the solution from uh, entirely generic initial data and some sort of very uh, symmetric Kastner like an isotropy. And adding a scalar field that's in a homo nearly homogeneous and nearly anisotropic background exert an equation of state or behaves like a, fl a perfect fluid with an equation of state that relates to the three times the kinetic of the scalar times the total energy density of the scalar, then we know that in inflation, we can extend the features of a nearly right kind of patch by keeping the Hubble volume nearly the same and uh, uh, making the scalar factor the physical patch overblow, so to speak, over it. And in slow contraction, the the, uh, the mirror idea was that, you know, I was also arguing and I will continue to argue that it's not exactly the picture that we end up with when once we look at the non-perturbative nonlinear physics. But, the, but as it was introduced, the idea was let's do the same as, as the idea was for inflation, but assume that the hot Big Bang expansion, expansion phase was preceded by a bounce that connected an early contracting phase, then instead of keeping the Hubble volume small, we shrink it on the physical volume, which ne re remains nearly uh, um, uh, the same. So this is just for a recap. The only thing what I want for the rest of the talk is that uh, uh, remains stuck or remains in your head is in one way or the other, the idea has been, and again, just the original idea and obviously what I won't be talking about, but I know, uh, and we talked about it and was individual since then with some of you, uh, this already with an inflation, uh, 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 um, different groups got beyond that, but the original idea was it's important to have the same one way or the other in distance causal origin for, for the patch that then will become the seed of our hot expanding universe. And just to finish the recap, what I have been arguing as well, that is not the hard problem. This is a good start, but this is not the hard problem of cosmic initial conditions. Uh, short of solving the quantum uh, Big Bang problem and knowing how you come out of the singularity, if the singularity indeed was the beginning of space and time or gave rise uh, in terms of a beginning to time, uh, 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 classical space time as we know it. Uh, one way of looking at from a cosmologist point of view uh, of, the, of the initial conditions problem is to say, well, uh, let's start, let's start, let's see 
if we um, start with the full Einstein equations and make the stress energy be sourced by a scalar field, which as you can see has a negative exponential potential. The negative exponential potential in the homogeneous and isotropic limit that you see on the right hand side admits um, or, or, or behaves indeed as a perfect fluid without, of course, scalar field ever being a fluid. This is also important uh, uh, since it doesn't have a fluid equation but the Klein Gordon equation. That's important in this case since um, those of you who keep it in mind uh, might uh, be able to very quickly calculate that this 1 over m square is exactly 2 times epsilon. So 2 times the equation of state, so the smaller uh, the characteristic mass scale associated with your scalar field is, the larger epsilon is, and this is exactly what we need to make the scalar field come to dominate an energy density, because as I was told that I can uh, write here, because the idea is that during a smoothing phase, the total energy density here in Planck units um, should be proportional to the scalar field energy density with the other contribution being subdominant. And here epsilon would be 1 over 2m. So as I argued, for an m being around 0.1 in Planck units, which is a reasonable number, you have an epsilon, which is uh, 50. Now that's huge. And as you might also remember, and here I stop with, 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 with the recap, uh, this was discovered relatively late for the reason, because as long as you only considered and this was within classical GR stress energy sources, uh, having always to be fluids, something like this would have been uh, a wrong or a bad or a assumption or a scary assumption, as can be, for example, written in Philip Thorne's thesis, who was uh, um, also then studying contracting universes, because in, um, if, if you consider epsilon as being, we know the proper 3 plus 1 definition of epsilon as being 1 plus uh, P, where P is the effective pressure of the stress energy component, rho is total energy density, uh, epsilon greater than 3 would require that P over rho is greater than 1, and P over rho greater than 1 in the fluids would include uh, super uh, sonic evolution, so uh, waves that propagate at speeds higher than the uh, um, sound speed is not good, we don't like it. I am aware that some effective field theorists argue that might not be a problem, but for Working with a canonical scale minimally coupled to gravity, of course, this doesn't, it's not a problem at all, since, as you will see on the next page, uh, the scalar field, or next slide, equation is simply uh, v comma phi. So, uh, um, the, from the wave equation, you can read off that um, the sound speed of a canonical scalar is always one. And this is the, this is the reason, I think, by this idea has been discovered later that you can get to a smooth universe to, to including a scalar field with a negative, relatively steep negative potential energy density. Because if you consider it, forget that it's a scalar field but a fluid, you think you might be in trouble. Now I should so say the, the, the phi dot squared yes. uh, being equal to one over m squared, that's just on the equation on, on that equation of motion. Okay. So this is also something I will show you in my talk. But 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 one can show already in for sure already in, um, inflation, that's why it's nice to take as your test case a pure exponential. Um, that's an exact solution that the minus 2 h dot over 8 square or phi dot square over 8 square is exactly uh, 1 over m square if you have an exponential potential. If you have another type of potential that actually I have, it should come out soon. Really, we are in the draft stage, hopefully in a week or two with my former master's student, Timo Kiss. We have worked it out. But what are the forms of potential that source to such, a, such an equation of state? And it turns out it has to be at least exponential during the smoothing phase. And but one of the main results of my talk, obviously, I take it away that this is indeed. So, what you want to ask is is that solution, does that solution have a large basin of attraction when you start from fairly generic initial data? And what I will argue in my talk, yes. It is. So what, what, what happens is that you are converging from non-homogeneous, non-isotropic, non-flat initial data towards a system. So that is really the one of the conclusions of the main part of my talk is towards a system that is described exactly similar by, by almost exactly the same equation of motion, and that's a stable fixed point, a fixed point solution of the equation. So that would be that is what we want to show. Right now we haven't yet shown it, but that would be the idea. And then you indeed have 
even though you started very far away from that approximation, outside the perturbative regime of that approximation, you would have the equation of state converging indeed to this, this solution. And so I should mention that we also, this was a very fun project. We extended it because there were questions, uh, and it was a big tough decision, but I want to present that because there were questions, how do we generate perturbations? And um, 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 is, is it also the smoothing that's robust? We did this for the two field models exactly that I was a little bit talking about, can generate nearly scale invariant fluctuations, which get uh, um, extended over super Hubble scales. So this is, I will, for the purposes of this talk, stick to the negative exponential, but I want to mention that, and I would be happy if there are questions afterwards, of course, I'm always around to talk about it, that those were both, the one is in the making and the other one uh, is, has been a really fun project with lots of details that I hope I can hint at. So what I want to do today is uh, to show you really the, as Ken asked me, and I'm allowed to do, the technicalities that it takes to get to the result that I was just mentioning, that this is a good description of where we go, but how we go there really can only be discovered uh, using full numerical GR. And those of you who were here in my brand back talk also remember that I will show you, or I can expect that I will show that uh, um, it goes differently than one imagined. Now, the next two slides will be a little technical. I really love this part, but those of you who think it's a little too technical, or I appreciate that most of you are not working on GR every day, don't worry, the movies will be completely understandable without the technicalities. But I have also been em emphasizing this in my brand bag that what really takes the big bulk of all numerical relativity work is preparing the the equations in a way that you can put them up. And so this has two meanings or two, two sides. First of all, you need a good kind of formulations of the field of formulation of the field equation that for given initial data admits a unique solution and the solution depends continuously on the initial data. Thankfully, with an Einstein gravity, it has been proven that it's possible. And hopefully time permitting the next five to seven minutes in my talk, I will have time to show you why it's so difficult to go beyond GR. That's the difficulty to go beyond GR, at least in classical terms, when you have a nonlinear theory that, that the Cauchy problem hasn't been satisfactorily solved in any classical, even Lorentz invariant extension beyond Brahms Dickey theories of GR. So but, before we dig yes? technically, so you go to a singularity, right? I mean, the, the end point of the evolution is a singularity. If I get to that, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Because so right now, and this is by the end I want to talk about that, right now I don't add anything that either in a quantum or classical we would, would solve the singularity. So what Massimo is pointing out, how does your code not know of the singularity? And that will be one part that we have to address. In order to have a long, sufficiently long stable evolution, just to solve the contracting phase, Ideally, you want to have the singularity in coordinate time infinity far away. That's the only way how the code will not see it, and we will see that. So that's, that's actually one of the, one of the features of, of uh, how you choose the gauge. That's where you get into the gauge. Because the second part of the story is you also want to have a formulation that fits well with your physical problem. So we don't want to see the singularity. We don't want that the code sees the singularity. That doesn't mean that we can. So this part of my talk will not connect to what we call the expansion. You just prepare a patch that if you are lucky and if you do it well, and obviously this is another part of my research, that you connect, can connect this patch without destroying it, its features, then that's a good initial condition for, for hot big bang expansion. So that, that's the logic. But here, we just only want, we just want to study the contracting phase. On the one hand, it's mathematically incredibly rich. So mathematicians a lot, in particular the firm and Radyansky in Princeton and Speck in Vanderbilt, study this, and this has been studied for a long time. As a matter of fact, this has, I just discovered it lately, that this formulation that we are using has its origin uh, um, in a formulation that Shuking introduced, who used to be in NYU for a long time. So this autonomous tetra formulation goes back up onto the Hamburg School, and Shuking was their uh, student of Jordan and was part of his work to develop it, and it was further developed both at JPL in Caltech and in the UK by George Ellis and others. So this is a formulation that has been used a lot, and it's actually so um, well known that it even finds into the last few pages of Landau Lipschitz, um, which I guess, the classical theory of course, which I guess makes it uh, classic. Uh, it was only lately discovered that this is good for numerical uh, evolution. So it's also yield your well formulation under search certain gauge conditions. But let's just tell you a little bit about the 
formulation that we are using. And why it's a good formulation for building numerical relativity codes, and both from the formal perspective and also from the physical perspective, in that it gives us uh, variables, so makes the Einstein equations, uh, uh, puts them into a form where the variables that we evolve numerically uh, are very close, very easily identifiable with physical observables. So that the um, strange or not so strange feature of this formulation is that instead of representing space time by means of coordinates, we represent them every space time point through a four four vectors here denoted by E naught, which is a time like four vector, and that gets complemented by a spatial triad, or we can call all these four vectors as some of you might know it as a fear bind. So these are four vectors which are uh, um, orthogonal to one another, and it's orthonormal because uh, we normalize them, that each of them have one. So it's an orthonormal basis that represents a space time point. In the same sense as coordinates give you um, the, the description of the space time. But is, and yes? Will it be important that this is contravariant instead of covariant? I mean, numerically? No, it will be because we don't. So we do a lot of work first, so must you ask all the good questions, to represent things in tetrads. But since we always have to solve numerically partial differential equations, eventually we will represent the tetrad variables in, in terms of a coordinate system. So we eventually have. The, both the lead derivatives in the time direction and the direction of the derivatives in the spatial direction will be represented to, and that is why I said it's technical, to a coordinate. So we will, and that will come into the gate choice in a second. So we, will first, we choose first a frame. Uh, um, this is a tetrad frame. And just before I get there, just let me say it is in the sense easy <laughs> that now your metric object is trivial. Locally, you are Minkowski. But what carries the what the metric used to carry is another tetrad vector component. These are the E alpha mu. And alpha will be tetrad signature just for those who want to follow it really. And mu will be coordinate signature. And the tetrad generalization of what we want to is a Christopher symbols. Uh, here you have a, a, a um, really what, what you want to know is how the tetrad, how a representation of a space time point in terms of tetrad gets deformed, how the tetrad gets deformed when you move from one space time form to another. So that's what the gamma alpha beta describes. Those of you who really are in the, in, a, in, the, in the known, and perhaps just because I'm not a kind of field theorist, obviously, but I know that uh, uh, some uh, um, use it that way. These are also can be rewritten. Uh, the gammas can be easily related to the commutators of the tetrads, and those are then the structural coefficients of the of, of the algebra, if you want to use it that way, but I prefer to connect it to the Christopher symbols because for me it's easier to understand. But there is a very simple mapping that the difference between two gammas is a commutator of the tetrad, can be associated with commutators of the tetrads. Okay, so what we do is now, this is really everything you need to know about this formulation, because what we do now here is so really you represent things to four, four vectors, which are orthogonal to one another. But what you want to know is what I said is, Okay, those are my dynamical variables, but how do I know what it means? How, how can I make it simpler? And this comes, this is really one of the parts that goes back to Schuching and Ehlers, uh, that is just for those of you who are interested in the history of the subject. It's actually quite interesting. I, I uh, learned about it because it was not clear until we worked it out what the meaning of these variables is. That's how I tracked it back to Schuching, but it's kind of an interesting subject and has a really almost 80 years, hist uh, 60 years history of how one got to this formulation. Uh, what you also do here, as many of you know, from the coordinate three plus one split is where you split the coordinate system, given a, you choose a spatial hypersurface and describe all the variables, the metric variables relative to the uh, spatial hypersurface here, you do a three plus one split with respect to the time lag congruence, A naught vector. And then uh, what you use is why there are only 24 and not a lot more structural coefficients or richer rotation coefficients is because the gamma alpha beta, as you can see it manifestly by just doing a, a, a integration by parts, is uh, anti-symmetric in its first two indices. So you end up with 24. So you have the 16 tetrad vector components as uh, the one set of the variables and 24 of the richer rotation coefficients, which have now physical meaning, the VA. So those, the first 15 are directly related to the time lag concurrence. They have a zero, so a time lag signature. And the first one is just the acceleration of the tetrad, the proper acceleration. The second one describes the rotation relative to Fermi propagated axis. 
And the last one is to shear, and this will play an important role of the tetrad. And all those coefficients, his uh, uh, ratio rotation coefficients that only have spatial indices, tell you the induced curvature of the spatial triad. So the E1, E2, E3. Okay, so this is a little abstract, but it will get very concrete in a second, because we will use exactly these variables to describe the space-time structure that we then evolve in time to understand how contracting universe behaves using a numerical relativity tool. And as I was hinting in response to Massimo's question, we have to now, obviously, we all know, uh, just choosing the variables is not enough. We have to fix the cage. In both, we have to uh, choose the orientation of our tetrad with respect to spatial hypersurfaces and with respect to Fermi propagated axis, its rotation. So we choose the simplest one that the tetrad doesn't rotate, doesn't have a non-physical rotation that knocks out our gamma. So there's three gauge tetrad gauge degrees of freedom where we have three more left. And we take the simplest thing possible to relate our tetrad to physical quantities. We say that our tetrad, which could be in, in an angle to any normal vector of a space-like hypersurface, we say we want to have a tetrad by the time-like tetrad, the A0, is coincide, does coincide with time-like vector of a space-like hypersurface. And that can be translated into uh, the condition that you don't have extra strain. So that means that your shear tensor is symmetric. And now, if you choose your tetrad frame gauge this way, you can associate the spatial tetras, the NAB, really with real curvature, then you have your space-time free curvature, your shear, the symmetric shear is indeed your space-time intrinsic curvature, sorry, extrinsic curvature, extrinsic three curvature, and the NAB is the in intrinsic three curvature. So this is now physical. And this will be important. And the two others, omega and BA, implicit in the acceleration of tetrad gauge quantities, omega is fixed, that we don't have extra rotations and BA can be fixed to an equation. Now, you are halfway through. So we chose a very good tetrad, in our case, good because we evolved now really quantities that de describe, you know, whether you are flat, what do we wanna know? If space-time becomes flat, so ideally you wanna see that NAB vanishes through the evolution, no matter how you start with. And you also wanna see that KAB vanishes, that means that would be homogeneity, this would be isotropy, and also NAB would be flatness. So zero NAB is flatness, and homogeneity, no gradients, we will get to the distinction, and KB, uh, symmetric KB, symmetric shear being zero, meaning you are isotropic. So that's fundamental to see that the system evolves there. Can I yes. just ask a question? So the, you wrote down the equation of motion in the homogeneous limit yeah. on the previous slide, right? So, mm -hmm. so this exercise is to evolve the metric for any initial condition? You will get to that. Yeah. Okay. So you told me I am allowed to be technical. So we are just there to define our variables. Then I will give you the full set of Einstein equation. Then I will show you how we evolve the initial data, and I'll show you the movies. Okay, so this is just before you before you lose it. That's, that's, that's the part. I just want that you see what goes into it. So I probably should mention it, but what I have been stressing, or I was stressing, I have been stressing, this is something you don't know a priori. So what you know is you don't know what formalism will work. You don't know what gate choice will work. So it's a little bit of a hunt and pack. And it's not by accident that we started and others started with looking at analytic formulations or at people who try to find exact solution of the Einstein equations, what devices they use, because that's the first thing what you try. You know, unfortunately, ADM won't work because it doesn't give you a strongly hyperbolic system of evolution equations. So that won't work. This is as close for those of you who are uh, too much technical. This is as close as it gets to three plus one ADM. Or no, uh, there's a reason the composition which we love. That, 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 that is the idea behind it. But it will give us a good set of evolution equations that we can code up. And, um, and this is the last technical. Now we come to the fun part. Because in order, so now we have, we could stop here if we didn't do numerics. But since we do numerics, as I mentioned, we have to rewrite the tetrad derivatives, which are Lee and directional derivatives. Um, and we have to represent the tetrad vector component into partial derivatives and the tetrad vector components we have to represent to coordinates. So we also choose a coordinate and now we fix the coordinate system relative to the tetrad frame. And if we choose zero, and as usual in ADM, uh, but it's not just a tetrad based generalization of ADM, what we do is we choose zero shift. So we have to fix 
So just to remind you, what we do usually in C plus one coordinate based formulation, we choose a spatial hypersurface and then explain the threading, how we thread together the spatial hypersurfaces by choosing the shift and the lapse. And here we choose the shift and the lapse to, exp to, to see how our coordinates move relative to the chosen tetrad frame. And of course, we don't have co-moving coordinates because what we have been trying to do here is to have as minimal of a gauge as we can. Don't have extra non-physical rotation. Don't introduce a tilt between um, the normal vector of uh, spatial hypersurfaces and your time-like congruence. Now, don't introduce any uh, shift so that your coordinates are co-moving with tetrad, which already gives you good physical quantities. And last but not least, we also want to have a time coordinate that allows us two things. Run as long as we can because the smoothing phase is long. So we want to run hundreds of efforts or unlimited efforts of, of simulations because we want to show that uh, we can prepare a universe that is smooth on many, many, exponentially many super Hubble scales. And we don't want to see the singularity, which short of, and this is of course the long-term goal, adding a resolution to the code uh, is there. And the code would, due to the covariance of the theory, the Lorentz invariance of the theory, if we, if the singularity was finite coordinate time away, then the code would find it very quickly, so it would blow up. Yes? Yeah, so, but you said you would do the numerics later, but why does the coordinate choice important for this? Well, this is important for two reasons, not to find the singularity, so that the code doesn't find the singularity, because, you know, what, what, what the numerical relativity code does is you give its initial data and you give it the evolution equation. And if there is a singularity in the equation, the code will very quickly uh, find it. So either blow up or you will see through code testing that it doesn't converge. And the second thing what you want to do is uh, you need coordinates also for the reason because you can only solve PDEs, you cannot solve tetrad equations. So you have to represent your tetrads in terms of coordinates. But what you also want to do is choose your time coordinates. This is something every one of you has encountered. If you have a phase where different dynamical quantities evolve at different places. Say the physical path should evolve, should contract at a much slower rate. If this is a this is a good theory, then then this the Hubble patch, then you would encounter a stiffness issue. So you also want to have a time coordinate and a time slice that a allows to put the singularity infinitely far. And it turns out that one of the numerical relativists favorite slicing condition, by the way, that was also the condition how uh, uh, Christodoulou and Kleinemann so, so uh, proved the. Uh, stability of Minkowski space. It's very similar to the system that we are using here. Choose constant mean curvature slicing. And that means that on a hypersurface, because now we have our uh, constant time hypersurfaces by our choice of a tetrad, constant time hypersurfaces, spatial hypersurfaces have constant mean curvature, meaning that the trace of the shear of the extrinsic, which, which I told you is associated with our three curvature or the mean curvature here is constant. And just so again that you can connect to the simple homogeneous uh, uh, case, this is the Hubble radius in the homogeneous limit. The homogeneous and isotropic limit, the mean curvature is one third. Uh, the, one third of the mean curvature is the Hubble radius. Uh, the absolute value, because in expanding, of course, it's positive. The contracting phase is the absolute value of the inverse Hubble parameter, which is the Hubble radius. So you, you do, not, do not care here that the coordinate system actually describes the maximal evolution of the uh, system because that coordinate system does not give generically the mass, a maximal evolution. It doesn't even give it in, say, take anti the seat there, right? If you yeah. take a constant uh, curvature, you yeah. just describe yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry patch, I mean, yeah. Pass mm -hmm. carry patch. You don't describe the complete space. No, I don't describe complete space. What mm -hmm. I care about is right now that I describe a sufficiently long contracting phase. It's not complete, yes, yes, so it's a good point. Uh, so what I choose, and this is really important now, because what I want to do, if I have constant, if I have a time slice and on that, uh, which is actually now, because I choose the, so my spatial triad that defines also time slice has constant mean curvature, I can use the curvature as my time variable. So all the hoopla was, apart from getting good variables also, so we can choose, um, coordinate time that tracks the curvature. So unless the curvature becomes infinite, so, sorry, unless the coordinate time becomes infinite, the curvature is not infinite. That's how we hide the singularity. And second, uh, it also enables us to track the mean curvature because it's now monotonic and uh, homogeneous, to use it as a, to hide the second dynamical scale that's in the homogeneous and isotropic, which is my Hubble, um, 
parameter from the equation. Okay, so obviously, uh, this is what, what, what is the second part. This is what I pulled up. So what you ask is, why it's difficult, why it takes so long? Well, you can imagine how many bugs can be there apart from the, uh, having the good solvers. But usually the solvers are, just so tell you a little bit about it, they are already developed, there are really, really good solvers on the market. We use the ones that are this, this developed by Choktui, his group, there are others out there because these are of course the same type of partial differential equations that are used in hydro that are used in other uh, Einstein gravity contexts. so that's th thankfully we don't have to work on that hard but everything else is hard in the coding and so these are the equations and you can see we have a partial for tactile vector component for the shear and isotropic component sigma alpha beta the spatial curvature and alpha beta this is a symmetric part i just split out and you can see here a box equation um, um uh, it is just as last three other scalar field equations but actually it's at, uh, three plus two it's five because this is a scalar field gradient now what i didn't mention but obviously um, um most of you have anyway seen that since my basic dynamical variables are first order this is a many so GR is second order in metric components, but because my dynamical variables are first order, this is a manifestly first order formalism. And my CMC slicing condition, so this is a hyperbolic system, it's a strongly hyperbolic system, and my gauge condition of constant mean curvature gave me the evolution equations for the Hubble normalized labs. So you could ask me, okay, where is your labs? You fix the shift zero, here is the labs. And this is, I use as a boundary condition for every new time step. So this is, these are the equations that we are solving. Just, yes? So um, you pick your initial slice mm -hmm. across the mean curvature, yeah. and then you evolve, let's say, one time step. Yeah. Is it guaranteed that the new slice has constant mean curvature? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Pylos equation. By always solving it as a boundary condition for the next time step. That, that, so this equation, if you set KAA to be zero D, so that, um, what you have to do is divide down the Einstein equation and get a second spatial derivative for the, for the mean curvature. I mean, for KAB, for the strain vector. And you take a trace of it. And you set it to be zero. So the second patient derivative of that has to be that is basically a slice that is no time evolution. And what you get is an uh, elliptic uh, or uh, elliptic equation for the labs. You can see this. And this we use as a boundary condition for always the next time step. So we solve this always. Uh, so we integrate. So we start with uh, this is the next slide. Uh, I will show how we choose initial data. And then basically everything difficult is true. Um, we, um, Choose the initial data in one time step, then we solve the elliptic equation and use it. Uh, uh, we have a solution for all the dynamical variables, solve the elliptic equation, add it as the uh, initial condition for the next time step. So that's what we do, and this ensures this and forces that my gauge condition is being propagated, so that I have constant curvature slicing. So uh, this is just um, to complete what we do. So we have a so called free evolution scheme, we use that which means that we know that GR, of course, obeys a set of constraint equations. And those of you who uh, um, are um, either following or experts, any of it, see the first one is the Hamiltonian constraint, the second one is the momentum constraint. And the others are just simple constraints for the tetrad variables, which we can write in as identities by using the commutators of the tetrad. The fifth one, for example, you can see easier, so the fourth one is simply just a definition of SA as a scalar field gradient. So we have also the scalar field equation in the manifest the first order. Uh, formulation. What we do is why it's a free scheme, what do we use this for? Well, in a second, and we use the constraint equation to set the initial data, and we also use the constraint equation for code testing. So it's a free evolution scheme because we don't prop them. So if we are right, and if the, if the system is well posed, then it has to behave exactly as GR behaves. Once you have constraints satisfying initial data, the field equations have to propagate the constraint. So we use that, we check the evolution of the equa uh, constraint equations and uh, use it for uh, verifying code convergence and stability. So we never evolve the constraint, we use that both to set the initial data and to check that our code converges. Okay. So in, in um, some of the initial yeah. calculations, yeah. like the Pretorius, et cetera, mm -hmm. The problem arose precisely because of that, because the evolution of the exactly. initial constraint was exactly. very unstable. Yeah. And one way to solve that was to damping. Yeah. To damp. yeah. But yeah. here you don't use any damping. It's right? exactly interesting. So I just, again, because it's a wonderful topic, cosmology, we don't get to use it that much so far. So what, what, what Massimo is talking about, again, because um, uh, it's really such an important issue. Um, so you can have, and I will show you, the issue with but Franz solved uh, um, with, with numerically modeling two black hole mergers was not not to have that positive formulation, but 
it looked like it, even though your formulation is fine, your constraints are satisfying initially, but the code kept going up. And what Franz saw and people were saying, okay, what was a problem? And that is that, that even if you have a well posed formulation, the, if you see how the constraint evolves, so it's, it's a numerical, it's an entire numerical artifact due to the fact that you can never completely satisfy the constraint. So if you have a violation of truncation error for the constraint, what happens is if you ask the Einstein equation, what does it do with the constraint? The constraint themselves in the, we will get to that, I hope in the last five minutes, I'm gonna show you because it's beautiful. It's a different formation. A harmonic formulation tells you that put the metric and the constraint themselves uh, uh, obey wave equations. So what it means is that the constraint, if you don't uh, satisfy them exactly, they will blow up. And that's why um, France and many people who use, it's very important for black hole mergers, use uh, uh, damping schemes. We actually get by without damping schemes in cosmology. So we converge and that's why we do the test. It's probably because of water locality, what I will talk about in the next 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Can I just but check off? Yes. Because I mean, in some sense, there's no difference between cosmology and binary mergers in the sense that in your initial conditions, there could be a situation where you form a binary black hole that then merges or you know, even a yeah. So do you mean you pick the initial conditions in such a way that you don't okay. form? Okay, good. So if we chose initial data, which is actually, so I will have all these equations for illustration in 2 plus 1D, which means that I will have inhomogeneity and isotropies only in two spatial directions. So black holes can form if I have initial if I have a initial data that introduces inhomogeneity in C plus one, but you got, but you also need spherical per perturbations or perturbations that become spherical before you become homogeneous because you need spherical uh, flux perturbations in three plus one D to form black holes. So if I did that, I would have to if, if I wanted to see and in fact there is um, Will East I know it probably with his student is trying to study now how. Uh, band, uh, sorry, black holes move to bands. Now those are not merging black holes, but if you wanted to do that, you would need a constraint damping scheme. So we could we could use, by the way, here the scheme scheme because so it has been used in that platform. So the original simulations we added them. We just discovered that we just discovered that we don't need them. So we tried it with them, without them, and it looks like we don't need them. But it's not that one cannot add it to it. So we, we did it first with we added to some of the evolution equations. Some, but what one does is one takes these constraints makes them dynamical by adding a parameter in front of them. And it's called damping because by the evolution you damp the constraint. And so we could do that here. We did that, but it turns out we don't need it. So it's, it's not that, uh, I only wanted to make the point for some reason, uh, perhaps because we don't have uh, compact objects or don't end up with compact object, or because we become so quickly ultra local that the constraints uh, don't blow up due to the truncation error. Okay, so let me just set the initial data because that's the heart of the story, right? So all the hard work was to not let, let us uh, uh, you know, play around with and choose the widest variety of initial data and see if we end up with the universe as we see it. And that's what the movies will be about. And just let me just go through it. The only constraint you have on the initial data is constraint satisfaction. If you, the other danger can be if you don't satisfy the constraint, we know the field equations propagate constraint violating initial data, but then you won't have energy or momentum conservation. You also blow up, but for physical reasons. So that's not a good reason. So that's the only, and now you have to do a little bit of work again. And okay, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because it's kind of a bookkeeping exercise again. Um, and this has been thankfully also worked out a long time ago by York and then Shoke Bruhat York. So there were a lot of good mathematicians who have, uh, how do you choose initial data that's sufficiently simple to choose? You can have sufficient freedom, your constraints satisfying. At the same time, you also are nonlinearly unstable. So we use exactly the same method as people use for black hole simulations, for example, for black holes. We take what's called the York's conformal method or the York method and choose a conformally flat metric where size of conformal factor. Now you might shout out, oh, didn't you say you have sufficiently generic initial data? Uh, we will get to that. And we freely choose the quantities that we think are worse during contraction, the scalar fields, initial distribution, its velocity, and the shears vacuum part, momentum constraint fixes the, uh, the momentum constraint fixes the shear's contribution to the, um, that's, that is sourced by the scalar field and its velocity on the initial slides. And so uh, we use a Hamilton Torian constraint, which then yields us an elliptic equation for the conformal factor to complete our set of initial data. What's important here? Well, first of all, you have already a lot of freedom. This is the only real constraint that my, some of you might worry about. Don't you assume flatness? And um, if I didn't choose, so what's important again to remember about relativity, it's nonlinear. It's a nonlinear coupled set of PDs. 
So just because you choose confirmatory flat initial data, you can check if you chose sufficiently generic initial data, generic again in physics sense, not mathematics, sense, that you excite very quickly within one or two time steps all the curvature degrees of freedom. And that's exactly what's happening. So while the constraints are propagated, we choose initial data that satisfy the constraints so that the field equations propagate them, conformal flatness is very quickly broken. So that's not propagated. This is really just a device to ensure uh, constraint satisfaction. And at the same time, be uh, able to choose uh, uh, um, sufficiently freely uh, um, the, the variables that you want to choose. And I should mention probably here because it's very neat what comes out. So what, what is nice about the, conf the York method is if you conform a risk the metric in almost all configuration, the momentum constraint and the Hamiltonian constraint decouple, and the momentum constraint becomes an equation for the shear and the velocity. That's why you can choose the vacuum part of the shear entirely free. And that's why you can choose these two contributions free. That's, that's thanks to the York method. OK, <laughs> and from the te technologies. And I just want to show you the reason why I show you all the technicalities, A, because I was allowed to do it. Uh, and second, because the simulations are, are very simple. So what, what you end up is you ask, if I only showed you the movies, and often I only have time to show that. If I only showed you the movies, then you would think, this is a mathematical simulation that you can do in one afternoon. Why? Well, because what our result is what we go for looks simple. And it looks as simple that after I explain you what the movie is about, you will actually wonder where the movie is going. It will be over before you take a look. But I will slow it afterward. So what, what, what I, of course, we saw the uh, uh, field equations uh, given the initial data, and we put the universe into a box. But the box size is to, we have periodic boundary conditions. So if I had shown you the function of part of uh, form of the shear, the, and that's what also is reflected here uh, to, the, to, the, to the forms, the shear, the, the scale of field velocity q, conformally scaled and phi, then you would see sinusoidal form. That's due to the fact that the initial data not just has to satisfy the constraint, but of course has to satisfy the boundary conditions. And so you have here a box which has the initial size, so the x and the y axis are both 2 pi times h dot times 1, so times the, the Hubble radius times 2 pi, um, the initial Hubble radius, and that will be fixed. So you see the entire space time uh, uh, shrinking down. You will also not see much scale in there, because remember, or if you do things right, uh, here the representative simulation usually involves an m of n point 0.1, so it's, then the scale factor hardly evolves. So typically, in a homogeneous limit, if you take this m, then uh, by a, shrinks down to, so a goes to one half a naught, uh, then the change, because it's e to the 50, uh, um, I showed it actually to you in a brown, but we don't have to remember, obviously, the Hubble radius goes to, I mean, shrinks by h minus 1 over h naught minus 1 is 2 to the 50, it's huge, it's really huge. So you cannot see much physical scales happening, and you cannot see the Hubble scale evolving because that's not this. <laughs> Hubble scale is here, that's a time parameter. So the time is following, it's the number of equals. And what you see here is, of course, the z-axis going from zero to, they have also negative, as you see, between one and minus one. These are the um, density parameters. Astronomers know it as the big omegas. Uh, they are representing the normalized Hubble normalized contribution of the shear green, scale of field energy density, and the spatial curvature. Those were the N ABs, those were the sigma ABs, and these are the field components. So total energy density. Now I let it run. <laughs> it's done. So this is almost always what we see. A simulation runs, we run 300, 400 default, doesn't really matter. But you see very, very quickly, um, space time becomes homogenized. And we will get to that too, in a very funny way. And you are dominated very quickly by homogeneous and isotropic contribution of the scalar field. No curvature, no spatial curvature, no gradients, no shear. Let's slow it down a little bit. It's really happening with order one e4. So it's a 25 times slow down. You can see the time is hardly moving. It's negative just because we run to so it's e to the t to the minus infinity. But this is just a technicality. I should also mention, you know that you contract because the Hubble radius is growing. If you were, expand, uh, the, if you were expanding, uh, sorry, the Hubble radius is shrinking, but the Hubble parameter is growing. 
because the absolute value of H has to, of course, in order to approach a singularity. That is the three curvature. Was of this mode. damping known in linear theory? Uh, which damping? Uh, you see something becoming smooth. Yeah. So then you can, uh, I would assume, expand around perfect smoothness to first order and see whether or not linear evolution. That's brilliant. That's what I do next. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's what I do next. I will close with it. I really hope that I can do. Let me show you two more things. That one part of that I will, uh, because that's really the part of it, what was known and what was not known. So the second part is mathematics. But what I want to show you, I showed you something that's pretty. Before we did our simulations, and this was what people believed the contracting universe was. This is just in Bondi. This is messy. This is what's called a, a Hasner. It's a vacuum universe, but it would behave in the same way. I will get to that too. Uh, it would behave like a vacuum, and it's, it's, it's a mixed master chaos. Those of you might have known it. It's a, it's a universe that is dominated by anisotropy, and it's bumping from one anisotropy point to another, and it's everything but, but what you need. And it's really the scalar field. And you know, the next five to seven minutes, I will explain why the scalar field with a negative exponential or a steeply of negative potential makes such a difference. In all cases, like whether you look at Kip Thorne's example, whether you have BKS or Balansky, Kalatnikov, Lipschitz, that's what they taught. The result is, and that's why it would be a really, really bad idea to smooth the universe to contraction, unless you have a right kind of scalar. Okay, so the real important part of the talk is what I spent a lot of time during the brand bag stressing how surprising it is. And also because it shows so nicely what you can do with numerics, what you what leads you eventually to analytics, what you couldn't do with analytics. Look at the nonlinear behavior and see if it's different than just doing perturbation theory and linear background. And so what we have discovered is one thing that has been conjectured really since balancing Kalatnikov Lifshitz, proven by mathematician in some idealized uh, environment around this anisotropic space time, is the fact that contracting universes is also in, in uh, Misner, Torn, Wheeler, <laughs> behave in a way that is very non-Newtonian, very counterintuitive, namely they, the spatial gradient. So you see this equation, it's a first order equation for the spatial curvature. And what you would think from naive, a spatial curvature drops first in an isotropy, and then you might smooth. But what happens is really, there are two kinds of terms in all the equation. Those that involve spatial derivatives, partials, and those that don't. And those that involve spatial, I call, of course, gradient terms. The others, because it's a first order formalism, were named by BKL, velocity terms. And the conjecture was in um, space time, you, those terms, the second type of terms, will exponentially faster decrease and decay than the velocity terms will quickly become velocity dominated. This is a nonlinear process. And then they told generic outcome is Kasner. So the first part, I agree with them. What you do is in numerics, you can use the numerics not just to make movies, not just as an endpoint, but also really to analyze your equations. So what we did is, and this is something I love doing because this you could really not do by pencil and paper. Uh, take all the terms in the equation, summarize them, for example, here or the right hand side, and take along the gradient term. And if I run them, you will see that the evolution is really very different. So what you cannot prove because it's really nonlinear and very generic analytically. So this is what all the terms do. So of course, curvature at some point decreases. you see around a 21 e fold. But what you see is these are the gradient terms. It's very different, right? Decreases much quicker. So the nice thing about numerics, you cannot just use it as a simulation. You can really show it to use it as solve my equation. And if we overlap the two and just take screenshot at the beginning, 50, 4, 10, 4, 30, 30, 30, you can see originally you are gradient dominated. So we chose initial data to uh, uh, represent what the locality. And Already at five e folds, you see, that also tells you that the curvature grows. So you are went very far away from conformal flatness. With lots of curvature in there, you started on that uh, with very little, but the gradients drop and they drop much quicker. So this is the confirmation that is uh, that 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 other locality really occurs. You just split up space time into different points. Now you can use a numeric to represent in different ways. You just pick points, and this would be what an isotropy dominated. We'll get to it, what it is, and then you can see each point in this circle. But they represent, you know, so called, it's a orbit space, it's just a different parametrization of an isotropies in the ultra local limit, but it's non linear. So, what you do is you start with them, and this tells you in what E for the color coding, you get to the middle, which is F4W. 
and different points. So what you can see is a lot of these still the same simulation, but different points of the simulation. You see a few things. All points go to the same middle, but they encounter different trajectories. And that's kind of cool because you also see what you have to, and this is what something that I made as the main point, and I will be done in, in, in a bit in time, because that's one of the main conclusions of the talk, uh, to show you that um, ultra-locality tells you that very quickly, because gradients vanish, each spatial point, and that was really what, what was conjectured, or one didn't think through, because one didn't see space time evolving to FRW, but to Kasner. What it means for cosmology means that every single spatial point is disconnected. So they have their own evolution. They are, that's why it's ultra local. So space time points evolve independently of one another. But, and this is where the analytic comes in, they all go to the same point. So it's causally disconnected. The reason is not because they started in the same, same patch, the same right kind of patch. As a matter of fact, what I thought was very important for you and, and for me to stress is that they get disconnected be before they become flat and smooth. Because the end was, as you, as I can show it to you back, you see, this is already almost entirely ultra local and you have lots of curvature. Can I go to that? Yes, sure. I'm following up on Andre's question. Yeah. I mean, so if, if at the linear level perturbations yeah. evolve this way, it seems like what's added by doing numerical simulations is to go very far from the linear regime. Yeah. Where you know, they're strong yeah. and numb. So, yeah. And you know, one thing would be like what I asked before, black holes. I mean, is there some other sense in which these simulations are exploring the very nonlinear regime? Well, um, this is one sense. The other sense be um, the initial data. I mean, studying the initial data, but if you want to ask it, I think you have two questions. What have I already done and what can I do with the simulations? So I could do what you asked. I could add in some black holes and start to track them. So that could, I haven't yet done that. So. That's one of the uh, things that I wanted to say when I uh, close that there's a lot more to be done if one wants to do that. So one can do that. One can check how bands goes through. I'm oh, sorry, I always confuse black hole goes through a bands, how black hole la leaves or maybe gravitational wave merges, what happens to gravitational wave fluctuations, why contract can they re enter. So you can do a lot of things. What you couldn't do, I haven't yet done everything. It's really just the results of one and a half to two years of what I'm showing here. So one, there is a lot more potential to do versus what already has been done. I'm really reporting here the most exciting results. Okay, so um, just what I wanted to point out is, and what you can also discover, and I will get to that, that the analytic calculation was not, okay, let me just keep it then just to get to the main point. What you can also do is, uh, and then I get back to what Matt asked, and also what Andre asked, um, you can also compare, of course, two different types of initiality. Now these are two different simulations. The point that I've been showing you is, different points of the same simulation. And then you can use the evolution. I do let me just keep it because it's a lot of technicalities and I would waste a lot of time to say, when I'm saying we call it term by term, so not just the evolve it, plot the gradient terms and conclude some. So this is partly an answer. I, uh, uh, this is, has been the focus of, it's very nonlinear how you drop the gradients. Because what we do here is we already assume we are ultra local. Then you do it analytically. Now, of course, what comes next is, that's why I was, uh, again, just as mathematicians don't show, by, of course, I'm far away from being a mathematician, don't show proofs. I just want to show you that once you numerically, by doing really hundreds of simulations and conclude that as far as by numerical experiments, you can conclude genericity, you are generically ultra local and you can identify the initial data that goes to FRW versus not, then you can go and say, okay, can I understand by some solutions, I'm almost true, uh, uh, some solutions go to FRW or most solution and some not. In the ultra-local limit, of course, I can do analytics. So I take the, let me just quickly walk you through what we have done. And I have one more slide. Uh, and unfortunately, I said time permitting, I couldn't get to the rest, which is more interesting what I'm working on now, but um, that's worth emphasizing. So what we do is here, we want to ask, okay, if you go to the ultra-local system, can you prove that given that you have a negative, what are the fixed point solutions of the system? You, the water local system will have a finite set of fixed points or stationary points, and you can study them analytically, which on the water local limit, which of the fixed points are stable and unstable. Now, we identified all the fixed points, and I should say that these fixed points are completely relevant because they are only possible for positive potentials. And what's happening is we find two stable fixed points, Hasner-like, 
where you have anisot very special anisotropy. So what was the neat thing about the argument is that you have this homongous system. By numerics, you can drop all the gradients, but what also tells the momentum constraint becomes very neat. Now you, are, you can see that the tensors that describe the spatial curvature and the anisotropic commute. And then by, because the, just using the fact it's a first order system and eigenvectors of at one time and I remain eigenvectors at all times, you can really by a neat three line proof show or four lines that um, um, you can reduce the essential the dynamics of dynamics of the eigenvalues. You then solve, you find the fixed points of the eigenvalue system, and you can by now linearize, <laughs> linearizing the, 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 the equations show that these are the two fixed points that are stable. One is this Kastner type, where two of the, where the shear eigenvalues are non-zero, and it's flat, so that all the spatial curvature eigenvalues are zero. And there is a, there where the potential doesn't play a role, so that's the funny simulation that I've shown you. And there is another solution, which is FRW. And now you can show the simulation one more and explore all the initial data that leads to effort, but all is always impossible, but use sufficiently many simulation that you can uh, conclude this, that the regime that it turns out that epsilon saw this parameter, which is the effective mass scale of the potential and the initial average velocity. So we have big local velocities, some of them go up here, some of them are down here, but what matters, it looks like the two parameters, how steep your potential is, and what is the average velocity. And it turns out that most of the initial data, um, so we are here only at epsilon 10, but typical epsilons are 50 and higher. So really, you would have to go here to have typical initial data, but what you can identify is, you want to know it's why it's not smooth. The second thing what you can show is, using again the same argument, this is the last movie I can show to close, um, that there is another fixed point. This is this Kasdan likes this one, it's very special. And this is all the work to answer Glenys' question, where is the constant coming from in the Friedman equation, the schema square, if you remember, where uh, you had this 3a square, and here was this term. So this sigma square is exactly omega s, so the Hubble normalized. What you find is that the eigenvalue, so this is a fixed point where n, the Hubble normalized maps exactly one third. So sigma is constant, there are no of diagonal terms, and the shear is uh, contribution is constant, and this a to the six comes just from the fact that you have to translate the first order quantity, which is a first order Christopher symbol, into um, zero to order quantity for biometric variable. But other than that, that's the origin of the sigma square. And what you can see is now you can study, and it was a separate study, and this is also something that you can only do non-linearly. How generic was the original equation? Do you first really go to Kasner and then to FRW? And of course, the earlier simulation already shown. No, not really, because you might become ultra local, but the curvature is important. The zero mode curvature exists, NABs are more important without partial than you thought. And what we did is, and I want to close with that. Unfortunately, I really didn't have time for the nice part. Nice part about the how we do the how we are but that we are working on other bands, but this is super nice. So <laughs> let me close with this. That what we also studied is um, start as close as possible to Kasner. So this configuration. And ask how far do you have to go for Kasner? How much do you have to poke the system that you don't remain there? And that would tell you, that would be a hint. And this is something I got mathematicians actually quite interested. Uh, um, so I hope that we will prove something about it. So there was this argument that ultra locality is generic, and mathematicians like the Fermus, with Tyler Rodnyansky, and fact that probably Kasner is non generic. And what we have seen here, at the very least, when you have a negative scale and start close to Kasner, so this is Kasner. This looks like Kasner, exactly Kasner, it looks like Kasner, right? Shear dominates, it's homogeneous shear. You have here some spatial curvature, and the scalar field is almost not there. And you would just think it's just bumping from one Kastner point to another. 60, 70 efforts and bump. And I can tell you what does the bump. It's actually the NAB, so the spatial curvature. So what turns out is that Kastner is, or it's just a little poking. It's really below, it's perturbative level, so we can understand that we have done that. It's, it's really at a perturbative level of poking. And what happens is because earlier people forgot both the negative potential, uh, the, the scalar with the negative exponential, and left off often these 
the spatial curvature terms because they assume we go first to Kasner. They didn't study what happens if you poke Kasner a little bit. And what happens is the tiny little spatial curvature term, tiny little off diagonal terms of the shear. So there is a lot of ways, and we tested it will lead you away from Kasner. So what we have concluded from that, and this is a conjecture, but it's well uh, uh, supported by numerical experiment that the, the second fixed point has a tiny basin of attraction. That's why you expect that in the auto local limit, almost all, and so starting from almost all, a significantly big part of initial data will go to FRW, and very few will go to what originally was imagined to be the solution. Okay, so this is unfortunately where I have to stop, but I hope that I gave you a little bit of an impression. Um, what one can do more than just pencil and paper calculations and really complementary. So what I also should say is, it's really my point of view, it's not replacing in any way effective field theory, fundamental physics or whatever. It's really just a complementary device to understand, you know, effective field theories or fundamental physics give us some Lagrangians. We try to do cosmology with it. And what do we miss if we don't look at the nonlinear structure? And I believe that here in this context, you already see that we miss a lot. The dynamics is very different. And at the very least, in the context of slow contraction, and this was really also where I stopped with the brown map, so it's appropriate to stop uh, here also by giving you more details about it. Is you learn that during slow contraction, smoothing works in a very different way. It has not, it's not the idea, it's not important at all that you start with the right kind of patch or that the one patch is the origin of, of many, many exponential, many patches. It's really this combination of ultra locality and having a system in the ultra local limit that has the FRW fixed point as a stable attractor solution that has a huge basin of attraction. And uh, for anything else, um, uh, hopefully, you know, um, if any of you are interested and there's a lot of nice mathematics in a completely different formulation, what I'm working on that mainly as in, in context of the numericals is really the question, okay, once you have this, this is pretty, can you now in a, in, a, in a way that is leading or the classical, bounce it over and truly have a initial conditions for a for a um, hot expanding phase. So that's again at least as much nice mathematics beyond Einstein, and hopefully also what we are hoping a lot of nice physics coming out of that. And I'm anytime really just sitting around the corner, please come by and chat with me about it. Thank you. So, so inflation uh, is sort of the analogous yeah. thing about the equation. If you have a, a black hole that forms early yeah. on, it has some fixed physical size, mm -hmm. and then the universe is growing exponentially, mm -hmm. the Hubble length is fixed. Mm -hmm. And so sort of the fraction of the universe that's occupied by black holes goes down exponentially, and the number of Hubble volumes mm -hmm. filled by black holes is, is more or less fixed because the black holes mm -hmm. have this fixed size. Here, on the other hand, the universe is shrinking slowly, but mm -hmm. the Hubble length is contracting mm -hmm. rapidly. So if you form a black hole near the beginning, it seems like the number of Hubble volumes occupied by black holes is going to increase because the Hubble is shrinking. The black holes are sitting there. So am I missing something, or is that? Uh, I think yes and no. No, actually, you're not missing anything except you have to ask it. So um, what is the overall volume? What is the dominant volume? So I think it's a very good point if you ask how many Hubble volumes will be full of black holes. Probably won't be a Hubble volume from its geometry. And what will the overall volume do? And so what really is happening, so this is at least the imagination, and you know, we did, this did start with 3 plus 1D, and that's one thing that we are um, doing. Um, there are some, let me just say, technical details why it makes it so difficult. You have to focus on a black hole, and what's difficult is the initial data. What is the right geometry to start with, which is on large scale something, which is not asymptotically flat initial condition and boundary, and it entails a black hole. So what Will East is doing right now with his student, and they only studied the bands, and I'm a little bit skeptical about that high generic death solution, is they impose that for W on the boundary, and in the, in, in the middle have a black hole with asymptotic flat uh, 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 environment. So I think that that's difficult. So, so I, will, I will answer your question. So what I'm saying is it's very difficult to do it. I think it will uh, require some Non -cons some considerable amount of analytic work to figure what is the right kind of initial metric that entails the black hole. The black hole is small enough, and it already feels the FRW and not just as a boundary condition, because if it's a boundary, then you cannot destroy the FRW solution. So you want that the black hole even can destroy the FRW. But what you ask is more is, 
The other extreme of it is that you just consider a little black hole as a spherical fluctuation. That's how you start with it. So you include what you did uh, in inflation that one could do here is, and then one follow that. That's, that's something that you know we haven't yet gotten there, but obviously we can do with the simulation. That's an open question. But what you ask is, what is most of the volume? So the, am I not worried that most of the volume is dominated by black holes and that's a typical universe? Well, the idea is most of the time that most of your volume becomes flat and smooth and there will be, so what becomes flat and smooth, let me say this way, is exponentially big compared to the volume that entails black holes at the end. So it's because the physical, so let me start it this way, sorry, I'm a little so. So let's take the initial box that have a number of black holes. We know that we have a lot of supermassive black holes today. Um, and you ask then, and as you say, those black holes hardly do anything. Maybe the distance between two black holes becomes a half by the end of, let's say, 50 E folds and the third by the end of 60 E folds. If you have an M being 0.1, if you have a steeper potential than that. And what you ask is, all the, but all the volume in between becomes smoother. So typically, there is that the number of black holes that's there and distort your physical volume obviously cannot uh, source your universe. So what I'm saying is the relative volume of black holes in the overall block, block that's uh, contracted becomes the same. The only question is, you know, now your Hubble volume is obviously in those black holes you don't do anything, they just sit there and this is, this is an open question. So that's why it's interesting to do that, that you start with a spherical perturbation in the big, um, uh, so that's it, the analog is what you have done, and then see what happens with the black holes. That, that is yet to be done. But the expectation is that the number of black holes remains the same as we have today, and all the volume, the physical volume is the same, but now you have exponentially many Hubble radii, and most of the Hubble radii are going to entail a black hole. So if you just by volume counting, it would be most of the Hubble radii don't entail a black hole. If you now wanted to introduce a measure for it, that entails probably one can do it, but just by simple volume counting, it would not be that most Hubble radii entail black hole. But what happens to a black hole should be done by starting with fluctuations that actually lead to black holes. So that's, that's, the, that's the answer. That's what I can give you. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, by how much the scalar field changes uh, during this evolution? Yeah, that's okay. So that's what we have been working uh, on with Timo my former master's student that what you want is of course what you would be worried um, from if you roll a lot right so the steeper you are the less you want to run there is a very nice relation if i get it right that the fly i just wrote a paper a few days ago so i still remember it it's some number it's an order of one number times uh the number of equals which is measured here in t times this m so which means if you have so this is the number of equals if you go order 100 then you hope that M will be of order 10 to the minus two, uh, then you get, I think it's M square or M, I think it's M, uh, but I would have to look it up. It's either M or M square, but I know that the conclusion, so I think it's M because the conclusion was that you likely want to have an M which is 0.01, then it was of order one uh, plan cleanse. So the steeper the potential, the better. And we also ran simulation with super exponential, which are even steeper, that is way below one plan cleanse. So it is, it you are describing what is also called the quiescent sequence. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a, so if you, oh sorry, I was told that I can write on this board. So if you have this potential and you roll this way, so there's a scalar wire, then this would be in 60 for your depth of five. Mm -hmm. And this would be an exponential potential, can be super exponential. So and then when it goes to the singularity, it's one of these. Well, yes, and well you would want to modify, so. so that would have been, you know, uh, what we have been working on, and this is something that requires going beyond Einstein. Mm -hmm. That that if it, it, this this would not bounce, this would crunch. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that's what that's exactly what you're talking about, uh, and it would be that type of single quiescent and singularity. But but what one does in the next phase that one hopes that one can bounce it. No, no, when you yeah. talked about the, the fact that uh, Kastner uh, yeah. seemed mm -hmm. to describe a little mm -hmm. corner. Yeah. Little, uh, it's for this potential, right? Yes, it, exactly. Yeah. There are many people who study. Um, yeah, like people with more and the and others, Nikolai, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Instead, they want to have chaos. Exactly, exactly. Billiards. The billiard ball example, yeah. and they they use uh, positive potentials of free scalars. Yeah. So that that was the chaos that I have shown in the simulation. Mm -hmm. They go to they they go to chaos. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have one question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. So here, do you mean here the contraction is contraction is already time will contract all the time? Uh, sorry, I didn't I mean, get. I mean, you the you mean the universe is shrinking, right? I mean, 
and yes. shrinking at the early time or shrinking at the late time? Uh, it's shrinking in our so if you start today, it would be in our future to the next cycle, but before the, the bands, what, what replaces a bank. So that would be early. So what, what oh, you yeah. okay, let me just show you it's easier. That is no worries, I don't explain it, but what happens is if you are here today, okay, mm -hmm. that this would be the time when you are contracting, you would have to go up, which is not Einstein gravity by a band. So this is for you very, very early times. So this would but this would be the bank somewhere if you have a bank. But if you bounce, you have to do that hike, which is obviously not possible in Einstein gravity or without some quantum bands. We try to do it with an effective 3 plus 1D description, but you are here today. So for you, it would be very early times. Okay. And so, so Masma uh, asked about the, yeah. the potential, but, but what if it's, so you require that H dot is large, right? Uh, yeah. In some sense, yeah, it because, is. Uh, yeah, if you are in the limit, squares, but, but let's say if it was not not a constant, so can can it work for yeah. large H dot? That's yeah, it's constant. it's actually exactly when I said the super exponential. So for exponential, it's constant. The approach is constant. If you have super exponential, epsilon can grow like crazy, and then H dot can. So H dot here is growing at epsilon times H squared, but it can go if this is a time dependence since growing, then then it can be even bigger. Yeah, but H dot. So so this is of course. Um, what people usually call the not so that guy is this. So minus h dot being always greater than zero or greater or equal to zero is an energy condition. So you always will have actually it's not a convergence condition in Einstein gravity, it's not an energy condition. So you will have an h dot that's always decreasing. And they will always have smoothing behavior like that as long as h dot is large and negative. Uh, and you have a sufficient, yeah, exactly, because that requires this uh, sufficiently steep negative potential. As Massimo pointed out, of course, if you had a free scalar, if you had some uh, fluid, if you had matter, if you had radiation, or if you just have positive potential and have chaos, then you have mixed master chaos. Okay, let's thank Anna again.